So you've decided to buy a 2013 Mac Pro, never mind the fact that it's now 2020. And of course, there'll be plenty of people telling you you're making the wrong decision and that their solution is better, cheaper or faster. In any case, if you've decided the 2013 Mac Pro is for you, then it's your right to spend your money how you choose. The question is, which specification should you buy? From factory, there were four choices of CPU, three GPU options, and of course, any combination of RAM and storage. In this video, what we'll do is we'll just run through those four aspects of the system, dig into it a little deeper to help you make an informed choice when you purchase your Mac Pro. Let's start by having a look at the original specs from Apple for each of these machines. Now at launch, there were four choices of CPU. So let's just run through these four options that were available. First of all, we had the quad-core model. This was the base model that uh, was launched in 2013 and it ran up to early 2017. It had the quad-core Xeon E5 1620 version 2 CPU. You got 12 gigabytes of ECC DDR3 1866 RAM, a 256 gigabyte SSD, and dual AMD Fire Pro D300 GPUs, each of those having two gigabytes of RAM. So that's the base model. Then you had a, an improved model that you could purchase, and that was the 6-core. Now, the 6-core featured a Xeon E5 1650 version 2 CPU, and you got a bump from 12 to 16 gigabytes of RAM. The SSD stayed the same at 256 gigs, but the graphics option was now two AMD Fire Pro D500 GPUs, and each of these has three gigabytes of memory. Now these were the two pre-configured options that you could buy directly from Apple or go to the Apple store and purchase off the shelf. Uh, everything else was a configure to order option or CTO as Apple calls it. Then in early 2017, Apple dropped the quad core model and they made the six core model the base model and added then the eight core as the upgraded option. So the 12 core CPU was only ever available as a CTO option. So let's just take a look at what the eight core gave you. Now the standard 8-core configuration featured the Xeon E5 1680 version 2 CPU. Again, you got 16 gigs of RAM and a 256 gig SSD, uh, but now you get the dual AMD Fire Pro D700 GPUs, and these have six gigabytes of RAM each. Now, of course, the 8-core CTO models prior to 2017 were custom built, so they could feature any combination of RAM, SSD, and graphics card options. Now, if you did want to do the custom order, you could specify a 12-core, and that CPU is the Xeon E5 2697 version 2. And you could have that CPU with anything from 12 gig upwards, from 256 gig storage upwards, and you could have any of those graphics card models with that. So there are essentially four elements to consider when choosing a Mac Pro, or in fact, choosing any computer, and that is the CPU, the RAM, the storage, and the GPU, or graphics processor. Now, the CPUs that we've just mentioned, those, those four examples were the CPUs originally installed by Apple, but those are not the only CPUs that will work in the Mac Pro. And many users have upgraded their own CPU, so don't be surprised if you're searching on eBay for a Mac Pro and you find a 10-core model, for example. It just means that someone has upgraded the processor in that computer. And it may well be the case that you're looking to buy a Mac Pro with the aim of upgrading the CPU. So we'll talk about those different options in a moment. But first of all, let's just dig a little deeper on the four stock CPUs that Apple offer to see which one might fit your workflow best. So to start with, we've got this quad core, the E5 1620 version 2. So the 1620 runs at 3.7 gigahertz and can turbo up to 3.9 gigahertz. And it has a 10 megabyte cache. Now, what does this mean? I've put some uh, Geekbench 5 scores on for single threaded and multi-threaded performance. So this uh, CPU scores on average 772 for single threaded, 3224 for multi-threading. If we step up to the 1650, this is a six core. It runs at three and a half gigahertz, but can turbo again up to 3.9 and we get a slightly larger cache, 12 megabytes. So you notice it performs on average slightly faster for single threaded at 780, and quite a bit quicker on multi-threaded uh, at 4847. Now the 1688 core runs at three gigahertz and again can turbo up to 3.9 gigahertz, and that has a 25 megabyte cache. This gives it 
single threaded performance of 868 and multi threaded at 6643. And then finally, we've got the 12 core, which is the 2697. Now, this runs at 2.7 gigahertz and can turbo up to 3.5 gigahertz, and it has 30 megabytes of cache. You'll notice that what happens now is the single threaded performance drops off. We're down to 659. That's a 24% drop off compared to the 8 core there. But on multi threaded, we go up to 7029. So that's about 6% better than the 8 core. So what you notice is the more cores you have, the lower the clock speed is. And there's a reason for this, and that is the higher the clock speed is, the more power that's being drawn, so the more heat is being created. So if you have more cores, you just can't draw as much power because it would just get too hot and the thermal performance would be substandard to say the least. The CPU would just end up throttling so you wouldn't get any performance out of it. Now the scores that I'm showing on this page here are average scores that come from Geekbench 5's processor uh, benchmark league table. So for all the people that have submitted a benchmark for this particular processor model, uh, Geekbench 5 takes all of those results and takes the average score from all of them. Those of you who've been watching the series will know that when I benchmarked my Mac Pro with the 12 core processor, I got a much higher score than the average being shown here. Now, why is that? Well, firstly, there is some variation between CPUs. No two are exactly alike. Uh, so even if you buy an identical model, you probably won't get identical benchmark scores from them. But that variance is usually quite small. A second reason is that these processors are not exclusive to Mac Pros. They're being used in all different systems made by many different manufacturers. And depending on the manufacturer's requirement for that system, they may choose to undervolt the CPU or restrict its performance. And that doesn't necessarily get reported to Geekbench when you run the benchmark. And so it could be that a manufacturer decides to slow down the chip a little bit to keep the thermals under control. And as a result of that, that skews that average score a little. A third reason is that Geekbench 5 is a relatively new benchmark, so all of these scores have been posted relatively recently. So we're not talking about brand new processors here, we're talking about systems that are probably getting quite old. Now it's not the case that a CPU degrades in performance just because it's got older, but it is true that thermal performance of a computer system will degrade over time. And that's because fans do wear out, uh, thermal paste that sits between the CPU and the heatsink to conduct heat away, uh, it dries out and becomes less efficient. And depending on where that system has been installed, it could be sucking in lots of dust and debris, clogging up the system and degrading the thermal performance. Now, if the system gets hotter faster, then it means that that processor will throttle sooner, and so you get a slower result. So we're not interested in the specific number of the score here. What we're interested in is the percentage differences between the processors. That's what these scores can tell us. It can tell us how much better one is over the other. And again, we need to point out that that six core there is 50% faster than the quad core on multi-threaded performance. Now that is a really significant upgrade. So if you're looking to buy one of these computers, bear that in mind. When we look at the eight core, we find that the multi-threaded performance is 37% better than the six core. And again, that is a big upgrade for only adding two additional cores. But when we go up to the 12 core, we're adding four additional cores, but we find that it's only 6% better than the eight core for multi-threaded performance. And the eight core is considerably faster than the 12 core when it comes to single threaded tasks. The main reason for these differences in performance is the turbo performance of the CPU. Have a look at this chart. Now what we can see is that all of the CPUs can only achieve their turbo frequency on one of the cores. The first three CPUs, the quad core, the six core and the eight core can all ramp up to 3.9 gigahertz, but the 12 core can only turbo up to 3.5 gigahertz on a single core. What we notice then is that the profiles for each of the CPUs are different. Starting with the quad core, you'll notice that it can only hit turbo frequency on one core. If it needs to use more than one core, it's going to clock down to 3.7 gigahertz, its base frequency. If we take the six core as an example, you'll notice that it can turbo up to 3.9 gigahertz on that first core, then it can hit 3.7 gigahertz for up to four cores, but if it's running all six cores, it can only achieve 3.6 gigahertz. The eight core drops off in a more linear fashion. You notice for two cores, we're down to 3.8, at three cores, it's 3.7, 
at four cores, we're down to three and a half. And then when we get to five cores through to eight cores, the CPU will be running at 3.4 gigahertz. And you'll see that the 12 core ramps down in a very linear fashion as well. So as soon as you get up to using six or more cores, then the 12 core CPU can only run those at three gigahertz. Now this is still above its base frequency of 2.7 gigahertz. It's fair to say that the eight core processor outperforms the 12 core for almost all multi-threaded scenarios. In fact, it's likely that the only time that you'll see the 12 core outperform the eight core is if you've got all 12 cores utilized. Even if you were utilizing 10 cores, you would probably find that the eight core processor would still be faster. When we look at single threaded performance, we see that the eight core is the fastest out of all of the CPUs. And this is despite the fact that the quad core has a higher base frequency. Well, we can understand why this is the case when we look at this particular chart with the turbo frequencies. You see those first three CPUs, the four core, the six core, and the eight core, can all turbo up to 3.9 gigahertz. Uh, the difference is that the eight core has more than double the cache RAM of the other two CPUs. And that's why it scores higher for single threaded performance. Now remember, this is just one benchmark and other benchmarks may vary depending on what tasks are included in the benchmark test. And of course, real world performance will vary depending on what you're actually using the computer for. But based on all of the research I've done, these results do match up with the real world reality of these computers. And that is that the sweet spot is without doubt the eight core model. So does that mean you should go and try and find a Mac Pro that's already got an eight core CPU in it? Not necessarily. You can upgrade the CPU in the Mac Pro 6,1, the 2013 model. It's not a particularly user-friendly process, and it might look a bit daunting, uh, but it's easier than it appears. And I've posted a video on my channel showing how that is accomplished. So if you are planning to upgrade the CPU, you probably want to go for a quad-core entry-level model or a six-core model, and then go and purchase a used CPU to upgrade it. And what you'll find is the combined cost of these two things is probably less than the cost of buying an eight core or a 12 core model on the used market. Now, of course, that has a big impact on total cost of ownership because immediately you'll have a Mac Pro that's worth more than what you paid for it. And that's a good thing. So I guess the ideal entry point if you're upgrading the CPU is the quad core. That'll be the cheapest model to find. However, don't rush off to buy it just yet because there are other things to consider. And if you're planning to upgrade the CPU, but you don't think you'll be doing it immediately, you may be better off buying the six core model because you'll get so much more performance in the meantime until you're ready to do that upgrade. Uh, now, what if you don't want to upgrade the CPU and you're also looking to spend as little as possible? Well, in that case, obviously get the best machine that you can for your budget, but I'd still probably avoid the quad core. Go for the six core instead if you can. Now, if you're working primarily in graphic design, so things like Photoshop or processing photos like Lightroom, then you would probably want to go for a six core or an eight core CPU. Uh, if video editing is your thing, then I would recommend either an eight core CPU or a 12 core model. Um, and for some applications, you may find the eight core outperforms the 12 core. If you're buying your Mac Pro with a view to running virtual machines, then obviously you're gonna need at least an eight core and you probably would want to consider a 12 core processor as that will give you many more options. If you're going for the Mac Pro for audio editing in apps like Logic Pro, then you'll find a six core will probably have you covered for most run of the mill things. Uh, go up to a maybe an eight core if you're dealing with more orchestral type of scores. Um, and really advanced audio professionals, you want to get the most from software instruments and have maximum number of uh, track inserts and effects running, you're probably gonna benefit from having the 12 core CPU. Now, what if you are planning to upgrade the CPU? What are the different options that are available to you? The Mac Pro has the LGA2011 socket. Now, there are many CPUs that use this socket format but uh, it'll depend on the chipset that's on the motherboard as to which CPUs are supported. So it may look like your Mac Pro could support a Core i7, uh, but it can. The only CPUs which will run on this motherboard are E5 version two Xeon chips. Now of the Xeon E5 version two family, not all of those CPUs make sense in the Mac Pro. So we'll just feature the ones that we know to work properly and that make sense as an upgrade option. So first of all, we have another option for the six core. This is the 1660, which runs at 3.7 gigahertz and has a 3.9 gigahertz turbo. 
and it's got a 15 megabyte cache. So it's slightly faster than the standard 1656 core. Um, but at this point in time, it's not gonna make much sense as an upgrade. If you had a quad core, for example, and you wanted to upgrade to a, a six core, the amount of money that you're gonna spend on this processor is probably not that much more to get yourself an eight core. And it's worth spending the difference. Here's another eight core option which is the 2667 and that runs at 3.3 gigahertz with a 4 gigahertz turbo and a 25 meg cache. What you'll notice is that this is actually slower than the stock A core model that Apple shipped with. The model name starts with a 2 because it's a CPU that's designed for dual socket use. Uh, obviously the Mac Pro 6,1 only has a single CPU socket but this particular CPU does work. Now it would be a decent upgrade from a quad core but I wouldn't choose this particular CPU to upgrade a six core model um, as it's not as good as the standard 1680. That's the one you should really go for. Now we mentioned 10 core earlier and that would be the 2690. This is a 10 core CPU that runs at three gigahertz with a 3.6 gigahertz turbo and 25 meg cache. You'll see that the performance actually is about the same as the eight core for multi-threaded, um, but it gives away some performance on single threaded. So it's really quite difficult to argue for this as a choice over the 1680. But if it's all you can get hold of, then it's a good upgrade CPU if you're starting out with, say, a quad-core Mac Pro. Now, there are other CPUs that work, but I've highlighted these particular models because they all have the same power draw as the standard CPUs that Apple chooses, and that is 130 watts. Uh, there is one model that draws 150 watts, but you really shouldn't go down that route and uh, many of the processors draw much less power. Now in theory that may seem like a good idea because a lower power draw would mean the Mac Pro would run cooler. Um, but these CPUs are not as powerful so you'll give away a lot of performance. And at the end of the day the Mac Pro is designed for CPUs that draw 130 watts. So why wouldn't you put a CPU in to that specification? Now there is also another 12 core option, that's the 2695, but again, that draws 115 watts. Uh, it's quite a bit slower on performance. If it's all you can find and you specifically need 12 cores, then it's a reasonable option, but you will find it's quite a bit slower. On single threaded, it falls way, way behind. So I wouldn't recommend that route personally. When it comes to CPU, then you need to just balance those various factors. Uh, single threaded performance is gonna be most important to you if you spend most of your time uh, doing day-to-day -day tasks like browsing the web, consuming media, playing YouTube, or playing some games. Uh, in which case, the 8-core is the fastest processor. If multi-threaded performance is more important to you because you're doing uh, pro tasks like audio editing, video editing, photo editing, then the maximum multi-threaded performance comes from the 12-core. But again, that sweet spot is the 8-core. So for general day-to-day -day use, go for a 6-core. If you want more performance, go for the 8-core. Uh, and if you have a specific requirement for the performance of the 12 core, go for that processor. Now let's go on to an easier subject, RAM. When it comes to the quantity of RAM, I would say 16 gigabytes is the minimum for any computer these days. Uh, but we're talking about a pro workstation here, so you should probably be aiming for 32 gigabytes, really. If you can afford it, go for 64 gigabytes. Uh, that's way more RAM than most users will ever be able to use, um, but it does give you a performance benefit. Up to 64 gigabytes will actually just improve the speed of the whole system. Once we go beyond 64 gigabytes up to say 128 gigabytes, you may notice a slight slowdown in performance. However, if you're looking to do virtualization and run lots of virtual machines, then 128 gigs of RAM with say a 12 core CPU is likely gonna give you lots of options. Now the RAM in the Mac Pro is DDR3 running at 1866 megahertz. You can buy slower RAM and it will work, but you're taking away performance from the CPU if you do that. So I would recommend buying DDR3 1866. And remember that it needs to be ECC RAM. The 2013 Mac Pro has four RAM slots and it supports quad channel memory. What this means is if you put identical sticks of RAM in each of those slots, then the Mac will be able to get a speed performance benefit because it can access all of those RAM bins simultaneously. So if you're going for say 32 gigabytes of RAM, you need to get four eight gigabyte DIMMs. Try to buy a match set of DIMMs wherever possible. 
Uh, you can often find that people have pulled a set of four DIMMs out of a server and are selling them as a matched set. And they will have been matched from the factory, so you know that they're running at the same speed. Uh, failing that, just make sure that your RAM is from the same manufacturer and it's the same model. So in other words, identical sticks of RAM in all of the slots, if possible. If you can't manage to get four matching DIMMs, then at least try to get matching pairs, if possible. And now onto storage with the SSD. Um, I've already made a video on my channel about upgrading the SSD and I've explained all of the different options there, so I'm not going to go into massive detail. But what you need to know is that the Mac Pro 6.1 has a single SSD slot inside, and it comes preloaded with an Apple SSD of the Generation 2 variety. Uh, now this uses PCI Express version 2.0 and it uses two lanes of that and gives you speed in the 700 to 800 megabytes per second range. Now in everyday use, that performance is more than quick enough. But if you're looking to upgrade the capacity, then you may as well get a speed benefit at the same time. So it's worth knowing that you can use a generation three Apple SSD. Now this uses PCI Express 2.0, but it has four lanes available and you'll get speed roughly in the range of 1200 to 1400 megabytes per second. So almost double the performance. There aren't any 2013 Mac Pros that shipped with a Generation 3 SSD, but these Generation 3 SSDs were available in the MacBook Pro and uh, some iMacs as well. So you can find them on eBay used uh, for reasonable money. Just make sure it's that Generation 3 and you can put that straight into the Mac Pro and it'll work just fine. Now you can also install NVMe drives in the M.2 format. Things like Samsung's 970 Evo drive will work just fine, as long as you have an adapter. You can find these adapters pretty cheaply on Amazon, less than $20, and uh, they convert Apple's proprietary connector to the M.2 standard. So you can use NVMe drives, although remember you may not get maximum performance out of them. Um, certainly something like Samsung's 970 Evo is not gonna run at full speed in a Mac Pro. Um, but you will get performance up to say 1400 megabytes per second and that's plenty fast enough. Now there are some minor drawbacks to going down the NVMe route. It means you can't restore your operating system from the internet at boot up using the special keyboard combination. And there are also some minor issues with running boot camp. So if you wanted to run Windows in boot camp using the internal drive, you'll find that's a little bit more tricky to set up. Um, some people have said there's problems as well with uh, doing a firmware update. Uh, firmware updates for the Mac Pro 6.1 are not very frequent though, so these are not massive problems and many people use the NVMe option and are perfectly happy with that. I would say if you go down that route, just keep hold of that original Apple SSD rather than selling it on because then you've always got the ability to pop it back in and it, it literally takes five minutes to do that. And finally that brings us to graphics performance. Now on the surface the Mac Pro should have fantastic graphics performance because it has two separate graphics cards in there. Uh, the issue is that the software has to take advantage of it. If you install Bootcamp on a Mac Pro, you'll find that the two AMD cards are actually connected using AMD's Crossfire technology. And in Windows, that works at a driver level and all applications can then make use of that additional performance. Uh, the implementation though in Mac OS is a little bit different and software has to be specifically designed to use both GPUs. So one of the GPUs is always running the display and the other one is kept for computational purposes. And the sad truth is that the majority of the time that second GPU is sat doing nothing at all. And that's pretty frustrating. Now there are three options for the GPU. There's the D300 with two gigabytes of RAM, the D500 which has three gigabytes of RAM and the D700 with six gigabytes of RAM. What's the difference between them all? Uh, let's bring up a comparison graphic to help us with this. Now the D500 and the D700 are both based on AMD's Tahiti architecture. Now whereas the D300 is based on the Pitcairn architecture. These are custom GPUs and you're only gonna find these in the Mac Pro. You can swap the cards around. So you could swap out your D300s for D700s. That would be a relatively easy thing to do. The problem is that they're incredibly expensive to buy getting on for the price of actually buying the Mac Pro in the first place. It, it just doesn't make sense to upgrade the boards. Now you can't swap the boards around inside your Mac Pro. You can't swap your display board and the compute board around, for example, because the mounting holes are in different places. You have a Type-A board and a Type-B board, and one of the boards also has the SSD mounted to it. 
Now, in benchmarks and gaming, you'll probably find that the D300 outperforms the D500. And that's because, as you can see, it has a higher clock speed. However, in real-world performance, particularly in apps optimised for using both cards, you'll find that the D500 has better performance. It's got more video RAM available, an extra 1GB on each card, and it has more computational performance. When those two D500s are working together in software that's optimised to do that, like, say, Final Cut Pro, then you get performance that's roughly equivalent to a Radeon 580 Pro. Uh, which is really great because, you know, that card is still being shipped in new iMacs and indeed even in the 2019 Mac Pro. However, most apps don't use both GPUs, so in that case your performance is halved. Now, since you can't upgrade the GPUs for a sensible cost, this is one area where you need to make sure you've bought the right model at the outset. So it's a bit of a Goldilocks scenario. The D300 is a little bit on the slow side. Some people say the D700 runs too hot. Apple has had a repair program running for the D700 and in fact the D500 as well. But from what I can see from my research, it's more D700 owners that are having their cards replaced. Uh, according to a recent comment on the channel, Apple are in fact still honoring that and still replacing cards. Although I suspect they're only likely to do that if you bought your Mac Pro new and had a warranty with it. Uh, if you're buying it used on eBay, I doubt very much that Apple's gonna replace your graphics cards for you. Now that doesn't mean that all D700s are bad. Uh, far from it. Many users have got D700 equipped Mac Pros and have no problems with them at all. But if you are looking to buy on the used market, just bear in mind people do sell equipment when they start having problems with it, uh, particularly if the manufacturer won't honour the warranty. So there is a risk attached to buying a Mac Pro that is equipped with D700 cards. Just, just make sure you do your homework. So in theory, Apple should still be supporting the 2013 Mac Pro until the end of 2026. Um, what actually happens though will depend on Apple's mood, I guess, and, and they could change that at any time. So just go in with an open mind and be aware of the risks that are involved in buying an older computer at this point in time. And try and find one that's in aesthetically good condition. The style and the look of the Mac Pro 6.1 is one of the main reasons why people buy it. It is a love-hate type situation. I personally love the design. I imagine if you've got to this point in the video, you do too. So make sure you get one that's in nice condition. Whether or not you're looking to upgrade the Mac Pro, you need to make sure that you get a model with the right graphics option. Probably not the D300. If you can find a D500, that may be the way to go. If you want to go down the D700 route, then that gives you a lot more performance. Once you've decided on your graphics card option, if you're not planning to upgrade the system, you just need to choose one that's specced out for your requirements. Uh, a six core will be great performance, eight core even better if you can manage that. If you have a specific need for the 12 core, then go for it. Just bear in mind that you're gonna pay a lot more for a 12 core equipped um, Mac Pro on the used market than if you did the upgrade path. If you are upgrading, you can buy the cheapest that you can find with the right graphics option. The CPU can be upgraded. It might be a bit daunting, um, but it's not as hard as it looks. Most users could probably do it. It's very easy to take the lid off the Mac Pro and even if you've never done an upgrade before, you will be able to change the RAM over and probably the SSD too. Uh, well, that's it for this video. I hope it's been helpful to you. Uh, if you do go and buy one of these Mac Pro 6.1s, above all else, enjoy it. It's still a very capable and stylish machine even in 2020. And why not share your experiences with us? Uh, use the comments section below. Tell us what it's like to buy one of these, use one of these, own one of these. If you've got any top tips to share, that'd be great too. Uh, I always really love reading your comments and I try to respond to as many as possible as well. If you're not already subscribed to the channel, why not click the button? I've got lots more Mac Pro content to bring and don't forget to hit the bell to be notified every time I release a new video. Uh, that's all, thanks for watching. and I'll see you next time for some more geekery.